and I seem to be on the second slide. I guess that doesn't really matter. My title is The Growing Interdependence of Refinement, Resolution, Validation, and Correction. Uh, at this point, with the complications from lower resolution structures and the great alpha fold ones, uh, we're needing to combine those things and think about them more together than ever before. And so I'm going to start off with uh, a slightly simpler problem, which is the basically three to four angstrom region uh, that has so many cryo-EM structures and quite a lot of, of X-ray structures of big complexes. And then uh, and think about the problems there and what we're, we and other people are doing about that. And then I'll I'll move to AlphaFold again and uh, to some of the strange things that I found in it, as well as the really good ones. So, so the, uh, the primary problem for us is that having run Malprobity for all this time and finding it's really useful around the two angstrom range that we're used to doing in crystallography both better and, <laughs> and uh, worse only to about two and a half angstroms because between two and a half angstroms and three angstroms uh, the carbonyls disappear and that's what gets you backbone conformation Particularly, it's bad for glycines because you don't also have the C beta. But uh, for any any uh, residue, at three angstroms, you really can't see those carbonyls in most cases. So next, or can oh I guess I can now. All right, that's good. And so this just illustrates the issue that. Uh, at around two angstroms, this is 1.8, you truly can see the direction and even very cleanly see the carbonyl oxygen. And so you really know how to model that peptide. But at three angstroms or worse, you can't see a bump for the carbonyl oxygen at all. And so it gets put in fairly random directions both by software and by people and if you have the carbonyl or the peptide misoriented then uh, that destroys the Ramachandran value on each side so you get two incorrect Ramachandran values and they usually move to the wrong minimum so it's part of the general problem that at these resolutions, you can more or less tell what's going on, but many distinct models are equally compatible with that density. Is your video on? Are you giving feedback? So that means you have to add a lot of other information, uh, various restraints and and also procedures where people do things like uh, refining Ramachandran values. And when you have the peptide wrong, that refinement will go the wrong place. So I'm quickly going to show that. Uh, there are these new tools, most of which I'll talk about briefly. Uh, so, the one that we developed particularly for this purpose is called Kablam. Christopher Williams, who's here on at the meeting, is the main developer of that. And it uses the same trick that many people have done of virtual C alpha dihedrals. And that means that you have one going in and one going out of a given residue, sort of like phi and psi. 
Uh, but the critical part of this is actually the dihedral between adjacent carbonyls, which again is a dihedral, and that's what goes wrong. And so uh, we've developed the system of a distribution, data distribution of what those relationships are between these three parameters in really good structures and the good parts of good structures. And so basically, the C alphas are about the best thing you've got at that resolution. They're certainly not perfect, but uh, they're pretty good. And they tell you things like, is this a helix? And then the orientation of the, carb the carbonyls tells you whether you've got it wrong. And this is just one case of a Kablam outlier. And when you rotate uh, that carbonyl, rotate the peptide, then you can make good helix. And another example with they, uh, map and markup, you would think that this would cause Ramachandran outliers. And the reason it doesn't is mostly because people then refine the outliers away uh, into a Ramachandran minimum into the the allowed region. And so what we've got here is actually a cis peptide and a clash and a Kablam outlier in pink and disfavored in purple. And so the model <clears throat> put that peptide up here in the beta region. And you can also see that the Ramachandran plot is pretty weird. Uh, I think a lot of that has now been smoothed out with uh, Pavel's uh, reuse of, of a more complicated Ramachandran distribution, uh, but it's still the wrong thing to do. <laughs> the overall uh, distribution doesn't look as crazy as this one, uh, but you do uh, usually, when you have a peptide misoriented, you will get two bad Ramachandran outliers that will go to the wrong place. And so the refinement actually pulls the structure in the wrong direction. And here's a beta example with several, and all but one of them ends up in the wrong minimum on the, on the Ramachandran plot. One of them just moves better into alpha. That, that's what you would want to have happen. Uh, but it usually doesn't. So the idea from Kablam is try to find your secondary structure early and try to build it ideal if you can. You can always change it later, uh, but making it non-ideal and being too slavish about following the exact data in the map is also misleading because that region is actually a pretty bad place for fitting secondary structure. At, at uh, two angstroms, a helix in the data is a spiral backbone with no density at the middle. And at five or six angstroms, it's a tube with the greatest density in the middle. And at three to four angstroms, it's moving between those two states and it doesn't do it um, smoothly. And it depends also on the side chains. At this resolution, you can't really first totally work on the backbone and ignore the side chains and then do them later because the density mixes at this size. So try to fix as many as you can of the initial model. And a number of them are pretty easy. If you have a, a, a Kablam outlier within helix or beta, you regularize the secondary structure. If they're two successive outliers, it's almost always the middle CO that's wrong and you can try rotating it. Then there's some others that are, that are harder to deal with. Although now um, there are better tools in Coot for this and also in, uh, in Isolde. So, uh, it's a really great fitting program. It's 
It's uh, user tugged interactive molecular dynamics. And it has uh, real time display of most of the outliers, including Kablam now. And uh, difference density and density, which changes as it goes on. Uh, it knows about the crystallographic symmetry and EM multiples and so on. And one of the big things is that uh, it's now been modified uh, to work really well with uh, machine learning models. And it's a plug-in to UCI Ceph Calmera, which is particularly nice if you're in the cryo EM community, because that's the really, again, excellent program that uh, knows all about symmetry in a very thorough way and is is what the cryo EM community is most used to. So there's another uh, more fiddly and complex way to test a lot of these things. Uh, it's actually making use of likelihood, which of course we've used in a lot of other places in structural biology, but people really don't use it in modeling. Um, but there's a way of kludging it by doing careful parallel refinements locally, right around the place that you're worried about, <clears throat> and uh, balance the prior probability of the confirmation you're worried about. For instance, this example is cis versus trans non-proline peptides, and balance that against the likelihood from the data. And this works remarkably well. So here's a incorrect cis non-pro peptide, but it's not totally obvious either to someone looking at it, partly because it's got a gly on one end, uh, but it does have a clash and it doesn't fit the density all that well. And if you remodel it as trans, <clears throat> you can see by eye that it fits better and it gets a hydrogen bond instead of the clash. And so if you remodel it, you, in this case, you can probably tell yourself. And that gives a huge difference in favor of the transform in the likelihood system of over 80 likelihood units. So that's an unambiguous, really obviously correct choice. And then even in much harder examples like this one at 3.8 angstroms, where you can't figure it out at all by looking at it. And in fact, neither real space fit nor R factors change at all, uh, but it still gets a log likelihood difference of 13.6. Of and so at that resolution, it would seem okay. In this case, you would make it trans, but if it actually gave a better likelihood as cis, maybe you'd feel you could build it. It's dicey anyway. But these paired refinements are the same thing Isabel was talking about, and uh, she's given it a name of verification, which I like. I think we'll, we'll see if we can use that same terminology for these parallel refinements. So second half, or not half, it's shorter. Alpha fold explosion. All of us have been obsessed with this and dealing with it and enjoying it <clears throat> and making our lives easier, certainly in the long term, and in some ways right away. So these are really good models, most of them. And uh, this is an example uh, from the CoLab Fold site. Uh, one of the things that I've learned looking at these is that you shouldn't talk about these models generically. Uh, depends not only what the protein is like that they're trying to deal with and how many uh, analogs it has, how many templates, but it also depends on which site you run it on and what parameters you use and, and how long you let it run and so on. So, uh, Jane, this is 15 minutes. 
Okay. So this one is a really good pair with very few outliers. And here, uh, there is the same worry as in, in uh, the three to four angstrom x-ray because uh, the machine has probably learned all of our validation criteria. We don't know specifically which ones or how it does it, uh, but there won't be very many outliers in the ones that are really modeled with high certainty. So again, uh, we stumbled on an interesting case. Usually when AlphaFold gives five models, they're all basically the same because it finds multiple templates. And certainly in this case, this is a pretty unusual protein in both function and fold, which I didn't know until we got into this. And there are only two template structures in the PDB. And so apparently AlphaFold uses one for each model, which I hadn't known before seeing this. And it ran out of templates for the last three and had a really hard time. And so if we look at some of these models, here's the best one, uh, which is quite close uh, to the very high resolution uh, main template, but does have some clashes. Uh, the number three one that has such a bad uh, PLDDT score uh, is not the right fold and has errors all over it. They're not in a terribly unusual pattern. This is something you could get or might have gotten in your nightmares in, in crystallography. But the, the AlphaFold database has a different sort of pattern. Here's uh, one from the human, uh, a human protein. And those, um, it's been obvious that in fact, they have a lot of, of unmodelable regions, usually big loops or tails. And what they do with it is give up. Basically, each peptide is put next to the ones in the sequence. It looks like it's done by translation almost, but this is sort of a default pattern. And almost every residue is totally crazy. This particular piece has about three quarters of it with uh, twisted peptides up to 90 degrees and you know every kind of outlier. And so when you get one like this, you really should just delete it. So the final ideas to sum up are, we need new validation that works for these cases. And at a fairly easy level, we can cover bigger regions like the five residues that go into Kablam. We can use more parameters like combining Ramachandran with, with side chain um, integrally in the whole process. And particularly we can combine model criteria with fit to model criteria, but we need much better fit to model criteria. And there were some ideas about this in this meeting already. And particularly uh, a version that's sensitive to unfilled density. And then I think we can actually deliberately evaluate critical features like uh, which residues can see the carbonyl oxygens. We can do paired likelihood refinements. And I think maybe machine learning could be applied well to a couple of these criteria. So this is our lab and thank you. And uh, if there's another minute or two, can I answer questions? Well, in a strict sense, there is no, but maybe half a minute, but whatever. 